fantastic guest. I've been very excited to have this gentleman on because he has probably, in my opinion, the most perfect first name. I have <laughs> Marine Corps veteran Rob Arndt with us. He's also the CEO and founder of uh, Buffer Springs, which is a fantastic, we'll, we'll get into the details there about how he's helping veterans and their families. But uh, before we get started, Rob, just want to make sure we're, we're good here on comms. We'll do a comms check, uh, radio check over. How do you read me? I am coming in, or you are coming in, Lima Charlie. Yeah, there we go. Lima Charlie, love it. Um, I, I, I really love, you know, I discovered you through uh, a few other veterans, actually, that were telling me about what you're doing. And I was nice. looking at your stuff online, and one thing led to another. So thanks for taking the time. Before we get into Buffer Springs and, and that awesome mission you're on now, let's let's time travel back a little bit. We'll get in the DeLorean, and we'll go back a, a little bit of time here. What yeah. what led you to wanting to join the service? And, and specifically, I'm really curious, because you are a Marine, you know, the best of the best. And absolutely the best branding. <laughs> what uh, what yeah. led you to go 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 Marine Corps and the job in particular? How did all of that come to play? How did that work out? So I know you're in Buffalo, so I don't know if you've ever been to Erie. So oh, I sure. grew up in Pennsylvania, not too far away from Buffalo, and Erie was it is still one of the poorest zip codes in the United States. It's a Rust Belt city. Poverty rate is in, you know huge. I think it's sixty five. Five percent above the national crime rate in Erie. You know, things have cleaned up a little bit, but I grew up there in the 80s and 90s. It wasn't really all that great. And the median household income right now, I think it's like $18,000 a year, which has improved from where I was. So I was notably poor and notably poor zip code. And mm -hmm. there wasn't a college fund. There, you know, parents weren't even there, let alone saving or thinking about my future. So that was basically my only ticket out of there. Ironically, um, I graduated from a very large high school. So we had a presentation for military day. So they sat 1200 of us in the, in the auditorium to talk about their futures and had each branch of service come out. The Navy came out, said that you could travel the world, do cool things, but he's wearing a bell bottom uniform and everything. I'm like, I'm not traveling the world. You're letting anybody see me in that. No offense. <laughs> uh, the army came out and said, we'll give you a $50,000 bonus and money, 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 money. But money wasn't really my thing because I've never had it. I didn't respect it. I didn't know what to do with it at that point. It's scary to me, to be honest. And the Air Force told me that it was going to be a cushy life, that I could dress like a bus driver to be like going to college, but I'm being paid to do it. And that didn't interest me. So as they were on stage talking about their, you know, about their benefits and, you know, all these things that are going on, I saw the Marine recruiter in the back in dress blues talking to the principal real quick. Every other service used the microphone at the top of the, the stage. Marine recruiter came to the end of the stage, popped to the position of attention and said, I've just been informed by your principal that my sister services have been jaw jacking a little bit too long about their benefits. I see maybe two of you in the crowd that has what it takes to do what we do. Um, if you're those people, feel free to take one of the business cards. If not, have a great day. Semper Fi, been about face, perfect one, bounced off stage. And I was like, that guy just punked out 1,200 people in every other branch of service. I want to see what they did. So <laughs> I wish I would have awesome. I went and grabbed one of those cards that day, but I didn't because I was still too busy being an eerie knucklehead kid, getting in fights and doing things that I shouldn't have been doing. So a few months went by, got into some more trouble, more things with the law where the ultimatum came up that I am not going anywhere here. And I'm actually going to start going in the opposite direction soon. I'm an adult. I'm not going to be treated like a child anymore. If I go in front of a judge, it's time for me to get out of here. So I went down to the Marine recruiting office. That same Marine who punked out everybody was there. They were in the office playing darts. And said, have you checked the other branches out yet? I said, kind of. And they said, go check out the other branches and then come back here if you if you still think you can do this. And I came back a couple hours later. They were still playing darts. And we sat down, got down to business. And that's where I was like, this, this is where I'm supposed to be. These people are wonderful. Love that's this. Awesome. And this is where I'm going. That's and awesome. That's, me, that's, fans, that's a fantastic uh, presentation on their part. Absolutely. So it was and that. That's just kind of how, how it all started. And then. I did 12 years active, 14 total with reserve time and everything else in there. And uh, yeah, it was a great time that, in my life. But That's awesome. Yeah, the presentation and, 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 the, and to basically tell a whole crowd of people, yeah, there's only two of you worth our time. You find us. And then when you found them, they're like, well, go to all of our competitors. And then go back. That's awesome. That's and, and I love that allure to it of just the fact that they said I couldn't do it. Just like everybody who I grew up around said I couldn't do anything or I wasn't going to be anything like right. I like proving people wrong. I like, you know, giving that, you know, that nod. Well, it's a special breed that doesn't work on everybody. Like you said, there was 1,200, only a couple of you went. So 
Um, that's fantastic. So, so let's talk about the the early stages of that. So, what what MOS? How did that go? Training, travels. How how did those first few few years work out? Yeah. So, first few years. So, I like I said, was a knucklehead kid. I was in and out of you know legal stuff, nothing serious or anything else. I'm just getting in fights and you know things like that as a kid, like everybody else in my neighborhood. But um, from because of that, I could not pick my MOS or my job. So I, the Marine Corps ended up picking it for me. So my first MOS was supply and logistics. I was a 3043 okay. warehouse. I worked all the reconciliations, all the gear, and actually became the de facto supply officer for 2nd Maintenance Battalion, one of the biggest battalions in the Marine Corps. Um, while I was doing that job, um, coming up in the ranks, um, a little thing called 9-11 happened um, about a year and a half into my career. Kind of uh, rewinding back though, for accomplishment wise, when I went down to Paris Island, um, Paris Island was simple for me. I, I actually graduated, this was the first thing I ever accomplished in my life, other than graduating with a high school diploma by the skin of my teeth because I had to, to go to boot camp. But I didn't re before that I didn't really accomplish anything and I actually ended up graduating number one out of 627 other recruits at Paris Island and was the company honor man. So from there I had this fire in me and it, it yeah. just continued to burn throughout my time in the Marine Corps. And it's continued to burn right now, to be honest. I mean, probably brighter than it did when I was a punk kid. But um, from that time, like, I just had this wind in my sails and wanted to overachieve, wanted to do things, wanted to give back to this organization and this institution that took me out of what would have been a bad scenario where I would have been dead or in jail. I know that's cliche, but that's where I was going, literally. So, so about a year and a half into it, you know, still climbing the ranks. I was going to school and everything at this time. Never thought I was going to go back to college was doing all these great things and then 9-11 happened. So we were in the initial invasion to Iraq. We were in Kuwait before, you know, when they were still talking about, if you don't let us in or look at weapons of mass destruction, we're gonna send troops over. We we're already in Kuwait in Tent City, ready to go across the border. So we were there for the initial invasion um, to Iraq. Um, learned a lot there. I mean, it was around wonderful people. I mean, being in a combat environment in a country where people do not want you there, it was an eye-opening experience. But the resiliency, the things that I learned out there really prepared me for the rest of life. It didn't really shut me down or anything. It was just doing a job at a high capacity in a very, you know, challenging environment. If I could make it through that, I could make it through anything. So from that point, I, you know, that wind was even deeper in my sails. But when I came back from Iraq, the rest of my unit was going to Djibouti, Africa, and I got flagged for recruiting duty. And there's probably still claw marks on the ground in Camp Lejeune right now of me trying to stay there with my unit. But when I got flagged for recruiting duty, that's where I found my real calling of what I'm doing now and that passion. So everything just in a roundabout way fell into place and yeah. set me on the trajectory that I'm at now. So, but that was early on, you know, what I did. I started off in supply and logistics, and because we did the deployment, I did a, a BMOS for nuclear biological chemical. We were training with the Brits, the Czechoslovakians, and, you know, getting to do decontamination tactics and all this stuff while we're out there, which was really cool doing joint operations. And then then I became a recruiter. Yeah, that's awesome. And you get other kids out of situations and gave them another opportunity. You know, it's a, it's a full circle. I love it. <laughs> And I'm in South, like I was in this area of like South Boston area, and a lot of the areas were very similar to what I grew up in. So I saw myself in those kids and those kids, I hope, saw themselves in me that they could do something else and they can get out of that condition that they were in. And, you know, in that time frame, we put hundreds of people in. I, I ended up staying on the street of Marine recruiting for seven and a half years, you know, coming up as a low end recruiter and then, you know, actually putting together strategy and doctrine after a while and looking at the way the the military recruits and served in the military and then, you know, just manpower and things like that. I just became obsessed with this concept of sales and business development, taking people from one place to another strategically it was incredible to me and still is to this day. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, like you said, you're true calling and figuring all those things out. Now, I have to ask, did you ever go to a, a class of uh, 1200 and say, there's only two of you here, don't waste my time? Do you ever you ever play darts? Do you ever do any of those tactics? <laughs> we you Played a few different tactics over seven and a half years and being in the middle of, you know, I was there on the, the, the streets for re Marine recruiting from 2004 to 2012. So mm -hmm. this is big wartime push. We're sleeping in offices and everything else. But yep. the beauty of the Marine Corps is that you do not have to sugarcoat anything. And it's actually worse if you do. Right. No one ever painted us Rose Garden. You're going to have tough times. Anyone who came into our office during that time, it's, hey, Johnny, do you want to enlist? I know college, all that stuff that the Army guy told you, but you're not going to get any of that because we're the Marine Corps and you're probably going to deploy. And I found out firsthand that my professor didn't want to go over to Iraq with me to teach me English. So it, it, we didn't sugarcoat anything, but 
out of that, we generated some of the best people and people that knew what they were going in. And for yeah, over 280 years, that's what the Marine Corps survived off of. And that's what is still going to this day is just people want to get the job done and don't care how ugly it is or what you tell us. They couldn't talk me out of it. They yep. punked me out, sent me away. But that's the people that we need is the ones that you can't push down. Absolutely. Yeah, there's a good friend of mine and a friend of the show. He's been a few times, Brian O'Hare, another, another Marine veteran. And he and I talk very often about the branding of the Marine Corps, the the most iconic, uh, you know, everyone in the world knows what the Marine Corps is, who they are, and why they're different. <laughs> J. Walter Thompson did such an amazing job with that brand. And I still remember it, you know, as a kid in the 80s and Saturday morning cartoons, watching that guy jump off a horse and battle a dragon. And I was like, I want to do that. Like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> unfortunately, for, the, for your listeners, if there's any kids watching those commercials right now, there are no dragons. And you're not going to ride a horse. I'm, I'm just telling you that now. I was disappointed, and I don't want to set anyone else up for disappointment. But the rest was real. They yelled at you, called you a bunch of things, and you became amazing out of it. Oh, it's fantastic. Good times all around. That's that's wonderful. So so walk me through a couple other things now. So you, you did your tour in Iraq. You did your recruiting detail. Um, I'm, I'm curious when you knew it was kind of time to you know move on to another mission. How did that we'll call it a transition, I guess, but like sometimes it's abrupt. Sometimes it's a thought that just kind of grows. What was it for you? It's a little bit different for everybody. For me, um, my Marine Corps career ended differently than I thought it was going to end and not as well as I thought it was going to end. So as I said, you know, I did 14 years total at this time, I was the end of 12 years. And at that point, it's like everyone who was telling me, Hey, you made it past 10. Now all you need is 10 more. You're halfway there. Go retire. But everybody who was telling me to stick around and retire was miserable. They didn't want to be there. They wanted to leave when I left. It's like misery needed company in the Marine Corps. Right. So, 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 they were, so everyone was coaching me to try to stay in. Um, but the Marine Corps was actually almost like pushing me out in a way, um, you know, so subconsciously almost. They were almost like making me quiet quit. So, running recruiting stations, everything else, I did whatever I wanted. Was could walk on water, do whatever. I ran stations. Like it, I had a ton of responsibility and a ton of, um, you know, faith put into me while doing those jobs. So in that, I became kind of a poster child for recruiting. So in recruiting, we have a, uh, a type of recruiter called a centurion. A centurion is you have 36 months on recruiting duty. And in that 36 months, basically people put in one contract a month, 36 Marines or something like that. And that's a check in the box. That's a successful tour. There are people who go above and beyond called centurions that put in 100 people over a 36 month span, which is few and far between. Between. There were only like three of them out on the street at the time. Um, so from there, that was another accolade, something that I wanted to chase. So in 29 months on Marine recruiting duty, I put 107 people in the Marine Corps. So I completely mm -hmm. eclipsed and crushed that goal, became a centurion, had my helmet and everything else still here. My kids play with it. It's on with my military junk somewhere. But, awesome. but now, um, but that was something that lit a fire in me. So from there, you know, I had this clout, this, you know, like aura, like I was where I was supposed to be. I was an expert. I was you know, anyone could see that, you know, coming from the, coming from, you know, just brief history or seeing that. But when I got out, um, it wasn't, I didn't know what I was capable of doing while I was in. So the way that it happened is that all these great things were going on. The colonel who I was working with was like, hey, Gunny, you know, everything is, when I was a gunnery sergeant, I was E7. Um, he's like, hey, Gunny, everything's been working out well. Um, you know, what we're going to do now is we're going to move you from Boston down to Garden City, New York. We're going to have you go do this on a bigger span and tour and do things with me and everything else. I said, sir, that's great. Love the faith that you put in me. Love the job that I'm doing now. However, I have kids in school. I have a house. I have a mortgage. I've kind of dropped anchor here. I'm embedded in this community. And that's why I'm successful, because I know people in my community. If you take me out of that, I'm not going to have the same strength for the Marine Corps that you think that I'm going to have or the same right. impact. And he had said, you know what, Gunny, maybe you didn't hear me. I don't care that you have these things. You are property of the Marine Corps. You are furniture. We're moving the couch to New York City. You're the couch. So I said, sir, and I didn't, you know, grow up on the streets in, uh, of Erie and, and surviving what I did, you know, not being smart and a little bit cunning. So I had actually negotiated my Marine Corps contract a few years back after learning manpower and how the actual regulations and things work. So I had put myself and worked it into a contract that's called EAD, Extended Active Duty Status. So on EAD, I can literally walk out of the Marine Corps. Everyone else who I'm around is on four-year contracts, five-year contracts that they owe back to the government or whatever. 
I have no camouflage handcuff put on me because I know the system. That's what I do is I learn systems. It's part of my how my brain is put together. So during that conversation, he said, we're moving to New York. And I said, sir, maybe you didn't read my contract, but I'm an EAD or and I'm not going to New York. I'm staying here with my family and I'm getting out of the Marine Corps now. So while well, everybody was telling me to stay and it kind of forced itself in there where the Marine Corps was going to make, have me make sacrifices to things that were more important to me than them. And I had to leave. We had a conflict of interest is that was it. And I wish I would have left with retirement and a box and all this cool stuff, but I didn't. I kind of left. So that happened on Friday. I was out of the Marine Corps on Monday. And then I got my first job in a cubicle selling a $40 hammer back to the government. After all the amazing things that I did, I went into my exactly what I was supposed to go into because I on my resume, I just told people I was a Marine or a sales guy or some insignificant crap that didn't even scratch the surface on an honor man who invaded a country and put hundreds of people in and changed lives. I'm just a sales guy, I'm just a Marine on paper. And I didn't even know my own value. So yeah. that's how my Marine Corps career ended. I wish it would have been a, a, a better story riding off into the sunset, but it was kind of that sunset happened. There just may have been a finger in the air a little yeah. bit when, when it was happening. I mean, but to your point, it could not have gone another way for you to then transition into this incredible uh, work you're doing now for everybody. So let's let's dive into that. I'm I'm fascinated by it. Um, tell me, tell me when it was a thought in your head to a napkin inked out and like what what was the what was the aha? Holy cow! I have to do this, or you know, th this has to be what I'm doing. So it happened from me getting my butt handed to me from transition and thinking I knew what I knew. I was a recruiter in, you know, South, like it wasn't like I was leaving Iraq and coming back home to Ohio with mom and pop or whatever and starting back over. This is a community that I was embedded in. I had contacts, I knew people and everything else. I saw all these military friendly companies and veteran friendly companies waving flags and they wanted to help me and hug me. And I was their hero. Like, why would you not hire your hero? If my heroes walked in the room right now, I would hire if Jim Collins walked in this room right now. He is my chief operating officer. Jim, if you're listening, please. I, I don't know if you're syndicated out in uh, Stanford, but if my heroes walked in the room, I would hire them. But they said I was their hero, but they didn't hire me. I, I don't know why. Maybe they maybe they were you know, scared of having their hero at work. You know, you don't want to meet your heroes until you do. And then the other ones were calling me a victim. You Marine, I've walked on water. I've done all these amazing things. No one's ever told me I couldn't do anything. Now all of a sudden I'm I'm a victim or I'm broken or there's a commercial playing with Sarah McLaughlin, arms of an angel, and this veteran needs your hug for 20 bucks a month and Mark Wahlberg on a commercial. It's like, what is going on here? So I I got that first job in a cubicle working for a federal contractor because federal contractors have to hire veterans, not because we're your heroes, but because the government told you you have quota. to. Yeah, it's a quota. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's it. So, so I got that job, went into a cubicle, selling a $40 hammer back to the government. And every time that we made a sale in this cubicle bay, also, I've never seen a cubicle bay before. They don't have cubicle bays in the Marine Corps. Like, that's not going to... When we build bunkers, we're not building them out of cubicle bay materials, not sturdy. Um, but, so so <laughs> as I was there, like, selling the $40 hammer back to the government, seeing what, what was going on with the space, like um, there we had this thing where we, there was a bell on the wall. And every time you made a sale, someone had to go up and ring the bell. So I felt like I was one of Pavlov's, Pavlov's dogs, you know, doing the science experiment. And it was demeaning. It was demoral. I've never ring a bell. I'm not, I felt like I was in like a process. So. The first week I was there um, in that job, I was like, wow, this is not the job for me. This is culture shock. Appreciate the experience, but no thanks. I would rather go back to Iraq than be sitting in this cubicle bay. And that that's real. At least in Iraq, I was around some of the greatest people on the planet. These people were eating a cheese sandwich and keeping their head down and just trying not to get fired. Like, that's awful environment for me. So so as I was there the first week, I'm like, man, this is terrible. I don't want to be here. I'm not supposed to be here. Let's find something else. So I went all to these military-friendly companies and... The ones that I may have been their hero, looking for whoever I was their actual hero. I couldn't find him, by the way, if until you know my kids. But so so I'm going through all these things and I wanted to get out of there the first week. It took me 15 months to get out of there. Well connected as a recruiter, well spoken. I went through every single, you know, every single path that you can think of. I changed my resume. I changed my cover letter. I changed my LinkedIn profile. I networked with the right people. I went to events. I went to job fairs. I shook hands, kissed babies. I did all the things that we were supposed to do. And I kept asking myself throughout that process of 15 months of saying, what's your problem? It's your resume. 
It's your headshot. It's you, you know, it, it's, it's all these things. And after 15 months, I ran out of me being the problem. Like it was, I fixed everything I could possibly fix. It's like, I can't go any further with this. Then I, this epiphany, this lightning bolt struck me and it was the, the solution is actually the problem. Unfortunately, the solution that's out there for veterans, the solution that's out there for companies right now, it is actually the problem. It's a bunch of people waving flags. It's 47,000 nonprofits, veteran support and service organizations out there calling us heroes, calling us victims. Some of them are great. Some of them are awful. Some of them don't even exist anymore, but still have a website running, giving false hope to veterans. So I went into this, what I like to call the sea of goodwill, and I drown in it. And that's what was happening over 15 months. So it wasn't that it wasn't what's my problem. I ran out of what's my problem. I came to the epiphany that this is my problem. No one owns this. No one puts it on their back and says, you know what? I got this. We're going to fix it and make it better. Some of the first, the best piece of advice that I ever got as a young Marine was Marines leave places better than we found them. No matter what, no matter where we go to, don't leave trash on the ground. Don't leave, you know, any, right. any, even no, no remnants of our existence, even in that place and leave things better than you found them. And when I came out here, this place was jacked up and no one owned it. And the people who I thought owned it had no ownership of it whatsoever. They're PE back. They're only looking at profit, not progress or their nonprofits and the way they generate donation dollars is talking to the world about how broken when we are, that we are, when we are the most amazing people on the planet. Yeah. Um, one of the things you said where Marine Corps has the greatest brand. I agree with you hundred percent. Jay Walter Thompson did a beautiful job with that. We, we try to emulate some of that with some of the branding that we do, to be honest, I love that brand, but veterans have a horrible brand on the opposite side. The Marine Corps has a beautiful brand. Veterans have a horrible brand. But we are a product that works. Yeah. The Marine Corps, like for Marines specifically, the Marine Corps has not lost a battle in 280 plus years. Not a single battle. Yeah. We're a football team that hasn't lost a single game. Right. 280 years. Where's the incredible. rings? Where are your rings? We don't. Why aren't we, they celebrating show, that? <laughs> snipers will see us. We can't wear them. But, <laughs> it, you know, but that's. That's what we come from there, you know, like from right. a branding standpoint, I came out and I've worked with these people who have done amazing things the whole time I was in the Marine Corps. You haven't lost the bat. We haven't lost about on 280 years. Aren't you better not be the re be you better not be the one that screws it up, you know, for me. <laughs> so and then I come out and I'm told that you didn't come from that team. You're broken. Yeah. Or you're a hero. You're something even the heroes that I've served with. I mean, we've all worked and served alongside actual heroes. Right. The most humble people in the world. They don't call themselves heroes. They don't wear a t-shirt. They don't want your flag or your hug when you come through. So I came out and realized that I wasn't the problem. The solution was the problem. And I've made it my life's work from that day. So I have this little red notebook right here. In this little red notebook, every, every dead end that I went to in the sea of goodwill wrote it down. Every idea that I had, good ideas, bad ideas, completely stupid ideas, by the way, are in this book. This little book, you know, going on flights, going to job fairs, everything, just taking down notes listening to things, absorbing content, absorbing as much as I could about the space and learning everything there is about it. I am a complete nerd about the veteran space and know everything that there is to know. And if I don't, I'll find it out. But I became obsessed with the concept at this day. And this is that little napkin and it still continues to travel with me to this day. But there's good ideas, bad ideas, but this is what has become Buffer Springs and our just hitting our three, three year mark. Like yeah. what was an idea and just out of desperation to solve a problem is now three years in and we are doing amazing things with or by for and with veterans only everything we do here is built 100 percent by veterans only no outsiders no pe no anything we're doing this for us yeah. and you yep i love it i love everything it, it, it's it's fantastic so let's get in the weeds for a little bit because we have listeners all over we got employers we got employees we got people looking to do both yeah. Um, walk, walk someone through this listening of, of where they, where they can, uh, fit into this and, and, and by, by fixing their problem, they're, they're actually also supporting the veteran owned business. So the big problem that I saw in my research and everything else is out there. We see the numbers out there that veteran unemployment is 2.7%, that it's 2.8. I think it's 3% now and then it'll dip back down. Those numbers are, they're not true. They're fluff, they're fake. 
They are counting people who are Uber drivers and Lyft drivers. They are counting veterans who are going back to school and using their student benefits and getting BAH. They're counting those people as full-time employed. They're not. What we look at and what we scratch surface on, the latest Call of Duty endowment study, and I think Penn State did a study on this as well. At the end of it, 61% of veterans are underemployed or in a job that we have no business being in. People like me that did amazing things in the Marine Corps and the civilian world didn't know how to translate it, so they stuck me in a cubicle. That sucked for me transitioning out of the Marine Corps and, and was a, 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 you know, a gut check for me. But it also was bad for that company. And I didn't think of that because I was thinking of me, me, me. Yeah. But it was bad for that company because they took somebody who could have did amazing things at their company and they stuck me in a cubicle. They didn't know any better. It wasn't that they hated me or that they just wanted to mess with a veteran or they hate Marines or whatever. It was they didn't know any better. They didn't they know what they don't to know do what they have the right there in front of them. Yeah. That's it. And and so that was the problem there is of underemployment. Yeah, it does suck for us as veterans, but we can change that if we just educate and we inspire people, you know, a little bit more than we we have been. So so that's what we look at is is the 61% underemployment rate. So with company, so we, the only way this works, and this is the most difficult thing about Buffer Springs, is that when I look at the military ecosystem, each, each person in there serves a, one primary audience. There are nonprofits that do, you know, resume writing for a veteran. It's great. But that person at that nonprofit, are they a senior leader of talent acquisition? Have they seen hundreds of resumes? Are they somebody volunteering their time? And, you know, like, think of the product of it. So that doesn't move. That veteran gets one okay resume, maybe that they go out with. I haven't seen very many good ones that come from those nonprofits, unfortunately. If you have a good one, please holler at me. But you know, some of them I've seen bad results. So, so you work with that one individual veteran, you don't get much trajectory. They don't get much push out of that resume or whatever. Um, the other companies out there only work with the companies. They sell job fairs. They sell database access and advertisement and everything which is great, it gives you exposure, gets you in front of that veteran audience, but when you're sending a recruiter to a job fair to talk to hundreds of service members and they don't know what rank is, or when someone walks right. up and says, you know, I'm a sergeant, that doesn't do anything for translating that skill. You're sending people to a job fair to hand out a stress ball and send somebody to your website, which doesn't do me any good as a veteran, other than I can squeeze that stress ball on my way home and you just sent me to a website after I spent three hours driving there and getting ready and getting my suit pressed and everything else just for you to send me away again. So, yeah. so that wasn't working either. And then, you know, looking at the veteran, um, looking at veterans in general, like there's not a lot of good education out there. The TAP program, transition, uh, transition assistance programs are terrible, terrible transition programs. They teach you how to not wear core frames and uniform uh, items to a job interview. They're not giving practical experience. It's a check in the box. TAP wasn't made to help out service members. TAP was made to save the government money of unemployment benefits because veterans were getting out and just jumping right into the unemployment line. So this at least giving us somewhat of an arm ramp. Skillbridge is something that's transforming that as well. However, the government keeps ripping the rug out from under our, our service members' feet as they're trying to execute on these and make better lives for themselves. So we can't depend on any of those things. So at Buffer Springs, it's this has been the hardest thing of us growing over the past three years is keeping that flywheel going of the ecosystem. We want it to simultaneously empower and educate that veteran, that military spouse of what their rights are, how powerful and how valuable they are in the marketplace. We also want to educate those employers and the right employers. Some employers that are listening to this right now do not deserve to hire veterans. You're trying to put them into high, you know, commission only sales roles or roles that they're going to be underserved. Please do me a favor, just stop hiring veterans. If, if you're doing that, if you're not looking at it as a strategic business angle, stop altogether. But there are employers out there that are well-intentioned that want to see their companies go forward. When I work with these organizations though, what I found is that most veteran initiatives are based off of two things. It's patriotism or charity, which are both beautiful things in themselves, but they are terrible reasons to hire people. What we concentrate on is the business case. We're not gonna hug this vet. We're not gonna make them our token or our hero walking around. It's not what any of us need. What you need is you have a production line that's down that you have hundreds of thousands of dollars leaking out of your company every year. I can fix that as a veteran. You have a skills gap across your company. We don't have a skills gap in the military. We don't have planes falling out of the sky and tanks breaking down online. It doesn't happen. We don't have a skills gap. You don't have leaders anymore because you treated your people horribly throughout COVID or whatever happened during that. We're all trying to get our companies back together, but everyone's leadership core is diminished. Ours isn't. It's next woman up, next man down, even, or next man up in, in even in combat. 
We have our Great. succession planning down for years. I worked on Marine Corps man pl planning. When you join the Marine Corps today, I know who your replacement is in four years already. That's how much of a machine we've built. Right. So with employers, we look for these employers that are doing it on the business case that veterans are a revenue creator. They will drive the business and they are looking for their future leadership cadre. For the community partners, we do a lot of vetting those out. So we have a full team here at Bucker Springs that their sole job is to cut through the sea of goodwill, shake hands, kiss babies, vet out the good resources and close the doors to the bad ones to make sure our veterans aren't going there. So we educate those veterans. We educate and empower those employers and the community partners and put wind in their sails that we create this velocity from this flywheel of good people connecting to good people and vetting those out. The veteran ecosystem, I, I like to give the analogy. You've seen the, the, the footage of downtown North Korea, right, where they try to make it look like it's bustling shops and the economy's doing well. And right, right. On the street, everybody's there because they're actors and they're paid to do it. And then on the second street back, there's cardboard cutouts that are supposed to look like a street, but it's really not. And then it's just bombed out. That's the veteran ecosystem. There are people on Main Street doing great work and will take the shirt off their own back to help out a veteran. There's also cardboard cutouts that are doing it for the profit or the, the sympathy or the pity or whatever that's out of there. It's disgusting. So I through that, we educate, we empower, we empower, and we accelerate all those sides so everyone knows what's going on and they can meet the right people throughout the right circumstances for the ecosystem we've provided. So very complex of what we're doing, but all the research I've done, that's where things fail. You only care about the vet, you only care about the company, or you only care about the nonprofit ecosystem. It doesn't work that way. It has to be everybody and it has to be done right. And that is so difficult for us to do. Yeah. 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 You 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 hit the nail on the head. I mean, that is that is a problem. There are so many incredible businesses that have great products and they think they have a well run um model, but yet you look at their uh you know, you you look at their staffing issues constantly. Last last couple of years, you know for sure. And whatever this new normal is of some people work from home in some positions, some people you know whatever that is for that business that they, let's let's just face it, every single existing business in 2019 is no longer around. It, it's all been redone. But who redid it, and what were their skills to redo it, and is it going to be long term? Uh, making them competitive because if they don't have the right people, <laughs> they're just buying time. You know, uh, it's yeah. almost like every every business is in its infancy right now because it's it's yet to be seen if they can keep their people happy. As we've gone back to well, I won't say we've gone back, but you know, post COVID era, um, it's like a new business. You don't really know if you have people that are going to stay 10, 15 years. But if you get the right people, and especially if they have a proven record because they were in the military, and I can't think of a more loyal employee ever than someone that was in the military. <laughs> no kidding. The other thing about it, too, is that, you know, when you think of it from a business case, we always look at the military, or at least civilians always look at the military as if it's like some foreign body or some distant world or whatever here. Right. Department of Defense is a Fortune 1 company. Yeah. Your Fortune 50 company may sell you know soda or insurance or whatever that's in there we're a fortune one company and our job is to fight battles and win wars we are really really good at it we have the strongest military on the planet in the united states ironically only one percent of our country is serving in the military by the way which is dangerous but we still have the strongest military on the planet it's not because of our budget it's not because of our president. It's not because of our history. It's because people like us step up every day and make it the strongest military on the planet and volunteered to do this and go in harm's way and be away from their families and make sacrifices for everybody who's back here. We have the strongest military on the planet. We've never lost a game in 280 plus years because of those people. That's it. So your company, you're not pulling from some foreign distant planet somewhere. You're pulling from a Fortune 1 company who's invested hundreds of thousands of dollars, sometimes millions of dollars into training their people keeping them operational and training them to be solid leaders. We're, the, the military loses 15% of its people every year. We can introduce you to those people and the right ones. What I will say is that for going back to my, my um, earlier point on patriotism and charity, if, if for those reasons alone, they, they can't drive your veteran facet. What I would recommend doing is really looking back of where you drive revenue in your company, where you, where you need assistance and see where amazing people could go in there. 
from that point, once you've done a dissection, so you can't hire all veterans. I'm going to tell you that right now. As a federal contractor, 200,000 of us get out every year. There's 19.4 million of us out there total right now. You cannot hire all of us. Your company only may be able to hire marine nuclear biological chemical warfare specialists to revamp your veteran program. Imagine that. We can do anything. Right. Army, not being. But you may only be, you can only hire certain people. You can't hire all women. You can't hire all people of color. You can't hire all people with disabilities. But if you find the right roles in the right seats on the bus, like the Celtics might be hiring right now, but they are never going to look at me and they will never win another championship with me on the team. It's all about finding <laughs> the right people, getting the right people in the right seats on the bus. And if you know what you're looking for, the military has dynamic people. But if you put them in the wrong role and you're putting a, you know, Marine grunt in the, in the HR therapeutic coordinator role or whatever, it's not going to necessarily work out. You have to see where people have been and what they're capable of doing. And you do that by asking questions. I've never met the same veteran twice and I've met thousands of us over the years. Ask questions, get to know people and get to know the dynamic, you know, individualism that they bring. Yeah, absolutely. And I can tell you that firsthand. I mean, I, I've been interviewing veterans on this show for years now. I essentially ask the same types of uh, questions. I never, and that's because I never get the same answer twice. We all have our own unique view, but we also have the ability to lock in with a team like you've never seen outside of the military. You know, we, we can be, we can be, uh, you know, from the outside, people think, oh, that's like you said, we got bad, we got bad, bad uh, branding. You go, oh, vets are brainwashed or they're all, they're all in this, you know, same mentality. No, we, we just have discipline. We have discipline to put our own individual stuff on the back seat when we have a mission that we're focused on as a team. It doesn't mean we don't have individual views and opinions. Yeah. It's just we know when to use them and when to shut our mouth and get our work done. <laughs> and that's the way that we get missions done and missions accomplished. While, yeah. while so we're why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you want as many, many of them as you could possibly fit in your organization? <laughs> Well, I actually had a conversation about this um, with one of our partners. So we are the official veteran employment partner for all of PepsiCo, Frito-Lay, Gatorade, everything that falls under their umbrella. And we that's were working fantastic. with them. It, it, and that's that's amazing as a young company that we're having the trust of some of the most beloved companies in, in the world. But it's because of the mission and what we're doing. And they're aligned with our mission. We actually turn away more business than we take on. But they're an incredible partner of ours. And I was on a call with them the other day. So they had a, a, a site down in Mesquite, Texas. It was failing, wasn't doing anything like basically they were about to shut it down. They put together this team of individuals from across PepsiCo to go down there to flip this and get it back on so they didn't have to close the site and close production lines, everything else. This dream team that they put together, of different people from different regions or whatever, would just they didn't really know that they were vets or anything else. So they put this team of like six people together. Four of them ended up being vets and from <laughs> different branches, greens and everything else, just, just from their background. They sent these guys down to Mesquite and they start talking about their backgrounds, getting to know each other. It's like, oh, I was Air Force. I was in the Army. Oh, I, I was in the Marine Corps. I was in Iraq from 2004 to 2000. It's like, oh my God, we were in Iraq. So like these guys yeah. like built this bond out there to go flip the station. But they ironically just picked veterans just based off of their work performance there at Pepsi. And I was talking to these guys uh, literally the day before yesterday. And the amazing thing that happened was just they wouldn't accept failure for an option. They came together. It was like basically like joint operations of what they were calling it. Like they were making fun of the Air Force guy, obviously. But, you know, um, you know, we, we need air support. We need beans, bowls, and Band-Aids. But, um, uh, <laughs> but they went down there and did this incredible thing. So within within 18 months of a, state, of a site going to uh, fail and be closed, within 18 months, they got it where it was site of the nation. Wow. They couldn't get anybody to even show up to work. Hiring was awful. The place was like run down, everything else. And then 18 months later, they had a family day for everybody there. And they had over 1,500 people attend this family day and giving back and the family saying like, you know, it's so great to see my husband back engaged and everything else and, you know, kids there and everything. So just seeing that transformation within corporate, but yeah. ironically, it was a veteran team that got put together. And I got to work with all these guys and they're still on that team doing that thing. And they're still like good friends to this day. This happened back in like 2006, I believe, when they did it. But it was a, like amazing that, just yeah. those things happening. Like yeah. what we have... Our skills can be used. We can go down there. Something you think is impossible, something that is run down and broken down, we can make it better. Yeah. That's what we do. Yeah, and to your point about the business, I mean, think of the money. <laughs> think of the money that we use to create this type of, uh, we'll call it work ethic. <laughs> you can't reproduce it on your own as a company. Why, why would you even think you could compete 
<laughs> I'm just saying. So if, you, if you're lucky enough to be able to hire a, some of them, you're you're using uh, products, we'll say, of that incredibly well-run machine. Yeah, and and I asked them, what, how how did you do this? And one of the Marines said, laughed a little bit and said, JJ did tie buckle, just good old fashioned Marine Corps leadership. For those of you that don't know what JJ did tie buckle is, it's an acronym that was you know ingrained into our brains for the Marine Corps. It's our leadership principles, our 14 leadership traits. It's it's justice, judgment, it, um, decisiveness, integrity, dedication. You know that's it, it's an acronym for things. But he said JJ did tie buckle, got it done. And I I started cracking up. I haven't heard that in, in a decade. And he's like it was just good old fashioned like leadership in in building culture. The policies, everything else were solid in place. Just people didn't believe them. There wasn't a leadership there. There wasn't anybody saying, hey, this place is bad today, but we got this. You have a good leader in place. You have another brighter horizon. And they built that. They built culture. They built security around that. And that's why the families came out and wanted to participate. Not, eh, that job you hate and come back and complain about every day. These guys have built like a family and camaraderie out of it. And just the electric like connection that they had after going through that bond, I was like, it was like you got that sounds the way that you guys are explaining the story to me sounds like that you were in deployment. I have the same story with my guys. How are we were in Iraq doing it? You were in Mesquite, Texas doing it. You know, like mm -hmm. it, it, it's incredible that that has such transferability, but we don't believe that it does in corporate America because of our own biases. We watch Rambo. and We don't want Rambo walking around our office. Well, neither do I. And Rambo doesn't exist in the military. Yeah, there is no you know? Rambo. Yeah. <laughs> or it's the it's it's the it's the PTSD violin that all veterans have PTSD and that we're all got to jump under a desk if there's a stapler that goes off or something when PTSD is a human thing. You have yeah. people on this station right now who've been bit by a dog, hit by a car, had a traumatic childhood that have PTSD and have never put on a uniform. We need to stop with the stigmas, stereotypes, and biases and putting people into a corner of what you think that they're capable of doing because a lot of us have changed the way the world works. We've saved millions of dollars of equipment, people's lives, people's safety. We've done incredible things and we want to do it at your company and hopefully you're intelligent enough to read through the lines and see what we're able to do and stop painting us with the same red, white, and blue brush. Yeah. Especially if you just look back in recent history, I mean, the, the economic boom in this country of the 1950s was a direct result of millions of American service members that get out of a horrific war and just wanted to go to work. Oh, you want yeah. to build a skyscraper that's hundreds of floors up? Sure. I'll do that. I mean, <laughs> in what other population can you find that type of workforce that's willing to do it and they're happy with a sandwich and a coffee and just, you know, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll go, I'll go lift beams for the next few years and build something gigantic. Sure. So a lot of the companies out there that, that haven't figured out what you're, you're trying to teach them. They might even be at a company that was built during that era because of exactly what you're talking about right now. So it'd be foolish to not re rely on the proof right there in front of you. I mean, Manhattan would not be what it is. You, you can go anywhere in this country the greatest cities, the the biggest economic economies in the city in this country, rather, uh, those cities were built by, for the most part, World War II vets. You know, yeah, absolutely. For the same exact reason. So it's it's the same mentality. We're we're all willing and capable, and capable of way more than any chart you've read or any stigma you're you're uh, you know believing out there. So that's absolutely. that's fantastic, Rob. What what's uh what's the best site? to get people started if there's an employer or someone that maybe is on the other side, they're trying to figure out which companies to, to go after for a potential career. What, where, where would listeners go for either of those options? Yeah, absolutely. So um, my porch light is always on for any veteran, military spouse, or any company that wants to get better at this or any community partner that's doing great work out there and is part of the solution and not part of the problem. So my porch light is always on. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. It's Rob Arndt. Last name is spelled A-R-N-D-T. I didn't pick it. Um, also, you can check us out on buffersprings.com. All one word. Um, that's buffer springs as it sounds. Um, so connect with us on there. If you're a military veteran, military spouse, we have curriculum. We have different gateways that we can help to get your trajectory back on, you know, back on track to you know, make sure you're getting into the job that you deserve and deserves you at the end of the day. And we're looking for career navigation and not just getting a job or checking a box at this point. So Porch Light's always open to all of you, all of our military brothers and sisters, including military spouses. Um, for employers, if you are trying to 
get outside of the patriotism charity stuff that I said, but if your business is looking to accelerate and grow, small business, large business, doesn't matter. If you're looking to grow, if you have the opportunity to hire for character at your business, you just need great people, leaders, and you have the opportunity to hire for character, but you can train for specific skill. With Pepsi, there is one machine in the world that makes a flaming hot Cheeto. That's it. Pepsi owns it. So mm -hmm. I have no experience in that, but I've worked on machinery or tanks or whatever that I'm in. That could cross over directly. But if you have the opportunity to train for or hire for character and train for skill, call us. We have some of the most incredible people that you will ever meet. It's curated. We source, screen, select everyone. It is a stringent process to work with us. But think of us as like a match.com eHarmony. We're trying to make as many marriages between great companies and great veterans as, as, as much as possible. Because our mission here is to eradicate and completely wipe out that underemployment rate of 61%. It's disgusting, and we've got this. Within the next 10 years, that number will be zero. Mark my words on this radio show today. We promise you that we will do better at this. If you are a company that wants to get better at hiring veterans, call us. We have your back. We will help you transform that. If you're a veteran yourself, stuck in the tailspin and going into the sea of goodwill, I've been there myself. So is our team. We have your back. If you are a community partner, we want to put wind in your sails. We know some of you are doing great work. We also know that some of you are in the way. We're going to fix that. Over the next 10 years, we will eradicate this, pro this problem at Buffer Springs and with our partners and everyone marching with us. And Rob, thank you for marching with us and having me on the show today. This has been incredible and love what you're doing. You've had a lot of great guests on there. You had my good friend Misty Cook on a few weeks back. Oh, yeah. Misty's awesome. Yeah. yeah. You're doing amazing things out there. Another, another so Marine, of course. Another Marine. <laughs> And, and a business owner, and she is killing it. M Misty is so impressive. Yep. I absolutely love it. I Just remind me to catch up with her, so I got to shoot her a note. But yeah, that's awesome. Shout watching. out to Misty. She might be on. She might be listening. Yeah. That's <laughs> a classic. Yep. Well, that's fantastic. I do I do want to do one quick fun. I always throw this fun uh, time travel question. You know, we talked about a lot today, and I'm, I'm very grateful because we covered a lot. And uh, folks, you know, if you missed any of the websites or any details there, the Lima Charles Show has all the links for Rob, his bio. <laughs> Everything's online. You can check that out if you forgot anything you mentioned. Uh, on top of that, we'll have the archive of this discussion there as well. But, you know, I want to go back just for a minute because we just time traveled, right? You said 10 years from now, unemployment numbers are going to be much improved. I believe that wholeheartedly, especially with folks like you doing the No, no I said no more underemployment for veterans. Yep. Yep. So we time traveled to the future. And uh, now I want to get back in the DeLorean here. and We're going to go back a little bit. <laughs> go, go back to the future. Um, if you had, I always ask this question. It's fun. If you had just a minute to go back in time now to Erie PA when you were growing up and it, with everything you know, right up to the second, go back and talk to your younger self as a teenager or whatever age you think it was before the thought entered about the military. Um or maybe the 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 day that they came in and you know talked to twelve hundred kids and and said everything about just only a couple of you that will make it, knowing that you were one that was going to make it and knowing you were going to be, you know the, the 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 everything just all these incredible adventures and, and successes you've had, what would be the message to young Rob? What would you tell yourself if you had a minute or less with him? I mean, the big thing is just uh, keep going. Uh, I. I grew up rough, you know, there were, there were dark, dark days. Same thing for, for the Marine Corps. There were also dark days early on in my professional life, early on in this, this isn't, you know, like Shark Tank and it's all like great or whatever. Like there have been days that I didn't think that I was going to be able to feed my family doing this job, you know, or not job, but building this business and building what I'm building for our people now. So it's been scary. What I would go back to say to young Rob is exactly what young Rob kind of told himself that he didn't really believe that you've got this and you can do it and just keep moving forward. As far as change, that question scares me of anything that I would change because of the whole butterfly effect thing. My life is exactly what, there's still chaos and challenges and everything else around me, but my, I, if there's any chance that I wouldn't have met my wife, my wife is my rock. I love her with my entire soul. So that would have changed that. My sons are my driving factor, seeing my three young sons growing and watching me building a business. My 17 year old runs a business, has eight guys working for him right now. Like that That's came great. from like watching this stuff. Like my life is exactly where I want it. Yeah, it's chaos and you know, all that, but it's, it's my chaos and it's beautiful. And I love where I'm at now. So I wouldn't change anything. I wouldn't kill an extra butterfly, anything. I would be very careful walking through. 
And even though some of those days were really dark, I wouldn't have been ready to do what I'm doing now and wouldn't be equipped to do the work that we're doing at Buffer Springs now if I didn't get my butt kicked earlier on in life. So I wouldn't change any of that. That's fantastic. That's good to know. Yep. Just keep marching forward and uh, force multiply and all that wonderful uh, stuff keeps keeps building. Build upon the build, right? So, Absolutely. Well, well, thanks so much for your time today. And uh, folks, again, this, this is a great talk with Rob Art, founder of Buffer Springs. I want you to go check that out today and share it with your network. You know, maybe if something came out of this conversation that wasn't directly something that hit a tone with you, there's certainly someone you know that's either a veteran looking for work, the right kind of work, or there's a business that needs the right type of people. So either way, you know someone that could probably benefit from this. So feel free to send send them to uh, Rob and his team there, and I know they're going to be in good hands. So, 100%. Yep. So, Rob, thanks, thanks, thanks so much. And, folks, we'll take a uh, quick break now.